Good morning, everyone. Good morning. While I have the pulpit commandeered here for a moment, uh, one quick uh, announcement on behalf of the discipleship team. I think we all agree that we've been blessed by all the babies and uh, children that we have in the church now and trying to provide for them uh, care during the service as well as during Sunday school. But while that's a blessing to have so many, there's some work that goes along with that as well. So we've had a faithful group that has stepped up and has been doing that, but they could use some support and some additional help. So if uh, that is something you'd be interested in doing, that you feel that you have a heart for children to either contribute as a helper or as a teacher, uh, just let Heather Jackson know or Terry Burkett or Danny or just any of those folks can, uh, can get you plugged in. So uh, the call to worship this morning will be the Apostles' Creed. Would everyone stand and state what it is that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, please remain standing for the congregational hymn. Just wait for the trade off. Please sing. <laughs> please sing with us King of Glory and Trust in God. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are king. So let's start right now. Why would we wait? King of 
Would the children come forward for a time that's especially for you? Well, good morning. I say good morning, ladies and gent. We have one gent. Uh, yeah. It's good to uh, good to see you guys. I I want to talk with you a little bit about a story you're going to learn more about uh, downstairs. But before that, I want to ask you a question: Is anyone having any fun this summer? And what are you doing to have fun? Anybody want to share something you're doing this summer? Yes. Okay. That's cool. That's always good. That's fun. Yeah. Ah, cool. That'll be fun. Anything else? Well, I bet it includes some swimming, right? Does it, does any any of your fun this summer include any swimming? Going. Going to the pool. That's always fun, right? So I brought a float. Uh, what makes a float float? Air, you got to have air in it. Okay, let me see if I'm putting any air in this. I don't know. This is an old float. It doesn't want to come apart. Uh oh. Here we go. You ready? See if I can get any in here. Is any going in? Okay, we'll stop right there. <laughs> I got to have some air left to preach, right? So air has to go in it to make it float, right? What I was thinking, you know, this thing has a little valve right here. Where's it at? You open that up and you put air in it. So I was thinking, but wouldn't it work okay if I, like, put Kool-Aid in it? It would. What about if I put a little sand in it? That would definitely sink. Uh, hey, I know what I can do. This will this will have to work, right? What about if I melted some chocolate and put it in there? It would burn it. It wouldn't work. It has to have air, doesn't it? I'm being silly. It does take air. No, nothing else will work to make it make it float. Uh, what do we use a float for? Floating? Yeah. Ask a silly question. Yeah. 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 You're right. You use it to float. It keeps us from sinking, right? We might say that it keeps us afloat, right? That's a, that's a, a, a way to say it. Thank you. So, I was thinking that our mind and our hearts are a little bit like this float. 
it, it takes air. It takes something good. It takes something special to, to make this float. Our minds, similarly, if we put bad thoughts or bad advice or we have a person that's always negative around us all the time running us down, that doesn't help us to float. It doesn't help us to stay joy-filled and happy and moving in the right direction, does it? But when we have Jesus in our lives and the Holy Spirit fills us and he encourages us to do things like read the Bible, uh, those are good words for us. Those, that's good advice. Uh, that helps us. It keeps us afloat, if you will. It, it keeps me joy-filled when, I, when God sends those kind of people in my lives, like a good friend uh, that, that helps me, or he sends me a message uh, in the Bible that fills me with joy and reminds me of how much he loves me. Well, <clears throat> you guys are going to look at a story today uh, in children's church. You're going to learn about uh, David and Jonathan, and uh, King Saul uh, was jealous of David. In fact, he was out to get rid of him. But God sent someone special to David's life. He sent a really good friend Jonathan. And, and Jonathan just built David up. He helped him be excited and, and encouraged even when he was down. He even warned him a time or two when, when his own dad was trying to get David. So we could say that God kept David afloat by that good person Jonathan in his life. And God can do that for us. He encourages us when we're down. He walks with us. You're going to learn today that God is our comfort, and he's always with you, okay? Well, let's pray together, and uh, <clears throat> just thank God that he's always with us, okay? Thank you, God, for being our comfort. Thank you for always being with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, you guys can go back. <clears throat> Let's join together in prayer. Father, we praise and adore you. You know, Lord, as the rain fell yesterday, I was reminded anew that, that you provide all our needs. And we thank you for much needed rain. And Lord, we thank you for all that you provide, for food, for shelter, for clothing, we thank you also for your guidance, for your comfort. We thank you for those great friends in our lives who, who support us. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Lord, some of us and our loved ones and friends are in need of an increased measure of comfort. We're in need of a, an additional provision right now. Some among us may be struggling financially, perhaps from poor choices of our own, perhaps from circumstances beyond our control. We pray, Lord, for wisdom that we might begin to change our situation, that we might be more disciplined in our finances. And we pray, oh God, that you would also provide. Perhaps some are looking for better employment. And we pray that you would open up those opportunities. Lord, some among us continue to struggle with grief. Maybe we've been in a season of grief and it's been difficult. We pray, oh God, that you would come and, and be our comfort. 
Lord, some are dealing right now with emotional struggles. There's been a lot of tension and anxiety in their lives. We pray that you would come and be their comfort and be their peace. And Lord, some, of course, among us have physical ailments. We are perhaps facing procedures or we're facing treatments or ongoing therapy. We have a source of pain maybe that no one seems to be able to diagnose. Lord, whatever it is, we ask that you would come and be our comfort, that you would be our strength, that you would be our healer. All this and many other prayers we lift up to you in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Please stand and sing with us. This I believe and believe for it.
and please be seated. Amen. Thank you for leading us. And I know uh, we've sang this, I believe, for a long time. I asked you to, and thank you for leading us in that, Holly. But uh, it just it fits so well with this series on the Apostles' Creed, and, and I'm deeply moved by that song. So thank you all for leading week after week. Let's pray together. Lord, we praise you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your word proclaimed in song. We thank you for those who have the gift of song, the gift of music. We thank you for the way uh, these folks and the folks in the booth just lead us uh, week after week, and we're grateful for that leadership. Lord, we thank you that we can gather freely around your word, and we pray that your word would speak to us again today, that we would hear your word, we would hear your teaching for your people. We ask this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Well, I want to read from uh, short passages, but just uh, from several passages. First, from 1 Corinthians uh, 15, uh, verses 51 to to, uh, 57. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then 2 Corinthians 5, I'm going to read verses 17 to 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then Revelation uh, 21, uh, verses 1 to 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, we've reached the conclusion of our study uh, on the Apostles' Creed. And the last three phrases summarize the richness and the blessings of the work of Christ. I believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You know, I often find myself smiling, if not outwardly, at least inwardly, when we recite those phrases. They're beautiful. They're wonderful. They're riches. They're promises. 
In Jesus Christ, you and I have the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So what do we mean when we say we believe in the forgiveness of sins? Well, I want to suggest this morning four images or four concepts. There are more, but these four might help you think about uh, our riches, our blessings uh, in being forgiven. First, there is the remission of sins. Remission is a legal term which reminds us that Jesus wiped away our guilt. He took it away by his death on the cross. The penalty, namely death, the penalty that you and I deserve was placed upon Jesus. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God in Christ Jesus is eternal life. I think of Isaiah 53, verses 5 to 6 here, that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, upon Jesus. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus took it all. All of sin's punishment was upon him. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. We might also speak of the forgiveness of sins in terms of being reconciled to God. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.19, In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. And he was not counting their trespasses against them. Sin had broken our relationship with God. But Jesus has reconciled that relationship. He's restored you and I to right relationship with God. A few weeks ago, we looked at the parable of the prodigal son. And I prefer to call it the parable of the loving father. But it vividly illustrates the length the father God will go to love and to be reconciled with his sons and his daughters. God has gone above anything we can imagine to reconcile us by the death of his son. The forgiveness of sins has also given us salvation or restoration, if you like them to all be ours uh, in, the, in the examples. Salvation expresses at least two notions. The first is that we've been rescued. We've been delivered from a dangerous situation. God, through Jesus, has rescued you and I from the fear of death and the power of sin. 1 Corinthians 15, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Salvation also points to the notion of, again, restoration of wholeness and health. Our lives have been restored in Jesus Christ. We've been restored to wholeness. I love 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. By the forgiveness of sins, we have salvation. We've been de delivered from the fear of death and the power of sin, and we've been given a restored relationship with God. We're a new creation. We've received abundant and eternal life. By the forgiveness of sins, we also have redemption. And redemption's a lot like remission, but the notion here is that we've been restored to a state of liberty. But that liberty came at a price. Christ's death and resurrection set us free from our bondage to death. Paul in his letters reminds us many, many times that you and I were bought at a price. We've been freed from bondage at an extreme price. We must never forget that our redemption, our forgiveness, is something precious and costly. It is God's greatest gift to us all. 
We've heard in the news recently about Corey Comparator, who was a victim of the assassination attempt on former President Trump. I didn't know Mr. Comparator, but he was much more than a victim. Because the report says that he used his body to cover his family, his daughter, to shield her from bullets. Romans 4, 7 says this, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Christ has covered us. Our sins have been covered by Jesus. He's completely shielded us from all of sin's penalty. Think about that. It's as if God, Jesus is over us, shielding us from all that Satan would bring against us, all of sin's penalty. So when we recite the creed, please remember the great love of God and the high price that he paid for the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus, you and I not only have the forgiveness of sins, but we have the resurrection of the body. Earlier, the Apostles' Creed reminded us that Jesus had been bodily raised. Now it's reminding us that that's our hope as well. That as Jesus was raised, we will be raised. And please note that the Apostles' Creed affirms a bodily resurrection. I certainly won't pretend to know everything about the bodily resurrection. No one does. But the promise in Christ that Paul reminds us of in 1 Corinthians 15 is that in a twinkling of an eye, our bodies will be raised. And they'll be changed. They'll be raised The perishable will become imperishable. The mortal will become immortal. Death will be no more. Death will be completely swept away. And not only death, but every form of sorrow, illness, everything that has plagued our bodies here will be gone. John Eldridge in his book, All things new remind us that everything our old age can strip away from us will be washed away in the new heaven and the new earth. Eldridge describes it this way, we will burst forth into the new creation like children let out for summer break, running, somersaulting, cartwheeling into the meadows of the new earth. I'm trusting he's right because I've never been able to do a cartwheel here on earth. I'm counting on doing the first of many in the new heaven and new earth. I get jealous when I see Gabby the other weeks doing these aerial flips without using her hands. I'm like, really? I can't even do it with my hands. But in the new earth, I'll do the first of many. More importantly, I'm trusting God's word. That in the twinkling of an eye, you and I will all be changed. I'm trusting God's word, Revelation 21, 4, that there'll be no more crying, nor mourning, nor death. Think about it. You and I will be free from grief. After conducting more than 150 funerals, I'm looking forward to that. In fact, 11 years ago today, I stood in the pulpit in the chapel and had to tell you that my 22-year-old nephew had been shot and killed the night before. I'm looking forward to never getting that kind of call in the middle of the night. You and I will never stand over a grave again. What a promise we have. What a hope we have. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, without that hope, you and I might as well close up shop and go home. But praise be to God, we have that hope in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. The last trumpet's going to sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Death will be swallowed up in victory, and we will have everlasting life. Actually, we're already beginning to experience that new life now. We're experiencing a taste of it in our relationship with God. It's a foretaste of everlasting life. The forgiveness of sins, the hope of the resurrection, and all the abundant blessings we have is a foretaste of what we will receive in full in the new heaven and the new earth. You see, everlasting life 
is not just the notion that life goes on and on and on. Everlasting life is life in all its fullness. It's a life restored to the perfection of the Garden of Eden. A promise of everlasting life might not seem so appealing to some of us if it was just an eternal life like we have now. But that's not the promise. The promise is of a complete transformation, a complete restoration, life to the full, life perfect as it was meant to be before we marred it by our sin. I want you to think about that, beloved. I think God wants you to think about that. He wants you to marvel at that. He wants you to long for that promise. Think about it. In life everlasting, there'll never be another war. Ever. We won't hear of a murder. We won't hear of a traffic fatality. We won't even hear of a robbery. The word cancer will not exist. No more surgeries. No more aches and pains from the ravages of aging. <laughs> you can finally throw all those pills away. You won't experience anxiety and depression. You'll never need to soothe yourself again by binge eating ice cream and watching reruns of Friends or any other sitcom for that matter. We won't experience dementia or autism or any other disorder. You'll never cry yourself to sleep at night again because of your pain or the pain of a loved one. And I don't think that's just pie in the sky and the sweet by and by. I believe that's John's vision. I believe that's a promise. It's a sure promise given by God. John in Revelation 21.1 saw a new heaven and a new earth. He said the, the former things had passed away. The things I mentioned and many more will all be gone. And the new will come. Earth will be restored to the glorious way it was before we messed it up with our sin. I do believe it will be the Garden of Eden restored. And I think the best thing about that is the promise John heard in Revelation 21 verse 3. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. When I hear that, I tend to automatically go to Genesis 3.8, where we're told that God walked with Adam and Eve that morning in the cool of the morning. He walked in the garden. And it's told there as if that was a, an everyday occurrence, that was a regular occurrence that, that God walked with them. Now, Adam and Eve, in this case, hid because they had sinned. But think about this. Because of God's grace in Jesus, we will intimately walk with God and we'll never have to hide. Revelation 21, 27 tells us that there won't be anything unclean or detestable or false to mar the new heaven and the new earth. We won't have any sin to hide. There will be no guilt, no shame. Instead, we're going to walk in a perfect and deep relationship with God. It's great to walk with Him now, but it's, we can't even imagine how good it's going to be to walk with Him in this intimate matter, way. Jonathan Edwards once preached a sermon titled, Nothing on Earth Can Represent the Glories of Heaven. And in that sermon, Edwards uh, called Christians to contemplate everlasting life. He, he declared that the loftiest of hu human language cannot contain the riches awaiting us. Eternity comprises the highest of all joys, he said, the deepest of all pleasures, the highest wonders the universe will ever know. And it will be the occupation of Christians for all eternity to take it in and to glory in it 
forever. So I was thinking, if, if that's our hope, and it is, shouldn't it be more evident in our lives? Why is there so little yearning for eternity among Christians today? Could it be? Could it be that we need to shake off the numbing pleasures of this world? Al Mohler, reflecting on Edward's sermon, writes, Will Christians, even in the comfort of Western civilization, cast off the vestiges of a world passing away and yearn for a glory that surpasses all understanding? How sad it is, as Edwards exclaimed, that many will forsake the weight of infinite glory and joy for a few fleeting moments of pleasure in this life. Christians must be a people who yearn for the resurrection to come when death and Satan will finally be defeated. Christians must yearn for the resplendent glories of being in the presence of the Trinity for all eternity. I agree with Edwards and Moeller and many who have come before us. We should yearn for eternity. We must live in this world. You, you've probably all heard the catchy phrase, some people are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. But at the same time, yearning for eternity is what helps us be of earthly good. It's what helps us endure persecution. It's what helps us and keeps us pressing on in difficult days. Yearning for eternity is what helps us war against our sinful pleasures. It's what motivates us to share the gospel so that others might live for eternity with us. It's what motivates us to open our hands and to be generous instead of clinging to our worldly blessings. Yes, let us be of earthly good, but may we be a people that hope, who yearn, for the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Well, I want to conclude this series on the Apostles' Creed by reminding you that the Creed ends with the simple word, Amen. So let it be. But the Apostles' Creed is as much a prayer as it is a statement of faith. It's a prayer for deepening our faith. It's a prayer that the power and the presence of God might touch our lives and deepen our love for God and our commitment to God. May the Apostles' Creed always be more than a recitation for us. May it deepen our faith. May it deepen our commitment to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And may the Apostles' Creed, Apostles' Creed continue to nurture us and encourage us as we await the day of resurrection and life everlasting. Let's pray together. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We yearn for your return and we yearn for the resurrection of the body and for life everlasting. And I know we don't always, and I know I didn't as much when I was younger, for sure, but part of me has seen enough in this old world and I pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. We look forward to the day that we'll never stand over a grave again. But we praise you that when we do now, we do so with the hope of the resurrection of the body and the hope of life everlasting. Come, Lord Jesus, for, for that time when that will no longer be a hope, but it will be a reality. We praise you. We adore you. We thank you that you would sacrifice your son that we might have the forgiveness of sins. 
and that we might indeed have this great hope. I pray, Lord, that we would not cling so tightly to this world, but we would prepare our hearts and our minds for the world to come. Fill us, fill us with a yearning for the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn today is number 56, To God Be the Glory. Please stand and sing with us. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you might abound in hope. God bless you.